Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell, a research fellow here at Cato and editor of Libertarianism.org. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our topic for today's episode is the environment. Joining us to discuss it is our colleague Jerry Taylor, vice president of the Cato Institute. Jerry, when I was a kid, there was a show that was on called Captain Planet. It was a cartoon and the idea was there were these evil businessmen who for whatever reason set out to pollute. That was like every every week they had some – That was their goal Yeah, actually. that was their yeah. scheme was to pollute <laughs> some river or something like that and there, there were these plucky kids who each had special powers but they would all join together to become Captain Planet who was a superhero – who would save the environment and stop these evil businessmen. And it strikes me that that is the way a lot of people think about environmentalism still, this, this sense that we have these maybe not evil but at least uncaring private actors out there who want to turn a buck and will pollute the air, do whatever it takes to get that money um, and that it's only through kind of banding together with you know the best intentions that we can with via the government we can kind of stop them from doing it and if it wasn't for us stepping in as this superhero we would stop them is that is there any accuracy to that i mean not to the the superhero and captain planet part of it <laughs> but to to the notion that business people in particular corporations or private individuals need to be stopped from using pollution as a way to turn a buck and the only way to do that is through the the power of the collective? Well, first of all, environmental policy like so much other policy discussions in Washington ends up being something of a very simplistic morality play, uh, evil polluters versus uh, environmental uh, do-gooders or if uh, you're on the right side of the fence, uh, anti-capitalist jihadis against industrial America. They, they tend to be rel relatively black and white conversations, rather cartoonistic and uh, rather simplistic as well. So Captain Planet is well within that venue. Uh, now, is there any truth to these sorts of narrative? Yes, there is some truth to this. Uh, the argument would go that uh, if a industrial actor – is not forced to pay for the environmental consequences of his actions. In other words, if you can pollute the atmosphere and other people pay the price for that pollution but you don't have to pay it, then you are going to be more inclined to pollute than if you had to pay the price. So instance, if you had a factory that was spewing all kinds of environmental contaminants out at smokestack, but the costs of those contaminants were borne by third parties, people who ended up going to the hospital, people who had to incur medical expenses, people had uh, property devaluations as a consequence of that pollution. Uh, they're paying for it and if the uh, company that's spewing the uh, environmental constituents in the air aren't paying for it, in other words, their costs are not internalized and these are external costs, then there's going to be more pollution than would be the case if they had to compensate victims. This this gets at the observation that a lot of environmental problems are associated with public commons, uh, air, air sheds, watersheds, things like that where we don't have individual owners. And in that regime, if you had a laissez-faire world, so the argument goes, you would see more pollution than would otherwise be the case were it not for A, government or B, torts which might internalize those costs. So there is something of, there is something of truth to the, uh, to the claims that are paraded about rather cartoonistically in uh, Captain Planet. So what can government uh, – government has done different things at different times to try and control those uh, negative externalities. Uh, EPA started in 71, I think it was, uh, Nixon and uh, we could either try and stop them from doing this entirely or we could try to get them to start trading these things or put a price on it. Is the government very good at doing those things? Well, there's a long and very interesting history of how we've dealt with pollution in this country. Up until the progressive era, we didn't have – environmental laws, pollution laws or things like that. We had a system of tort. Uh, the uh, uh, law in the United States treated uh, environmental pollution as a trespass. If a uh, industrial actor or factory polluted water, then the person who was downstream from uh, that pollution who was exposed to these pollutants, maybe a farmer uh, who relied on that water for irrigation, would have a, would have a case to go into, into court and file a nuisance or trespass case and seek compensation. 
Uh, so there were no special environmental laws. We dealt with pollution in the court system as a trespass on property rights. Historians of that period look back and say, well, what, what changed? Why did we abandon that regime where we dealt with pollution as a trespass or a nuisance to a regime in which we regulated it from the state? And the argument which seems most persuasive to me is that we abandoned it because industrial actors found that property rights as a means of dealing with pollution was – too restrictive on their operations. They argued there was a public good to uh, manufacturing and to industrial activity and that this public good was not being captured by a strict observance of property rights, which is why we needed regulatory bodies to decide how much pollution can be uh, 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 issued by industrial actors, how much of the public commons can be claimed by these actors and even to what extent uh, industrial actors can pollute on private property in the public interest. So the public itself would make this decision, not courts going on property rights. So the regulatory state grew not out of environmentalist complaint over uh, uh, run-amuck pollution. It grew out of industrialist and manufacturing complaint out of an overly restricted regime of property rights. And what followed from these rules were initially more liberal pollution rules. Uh, the uh, industrial actors and uh, other polluters could indeed – were indeed uh, liberated to some extent from the constraints of property rights at that time. But it didn't last for long or at least it didn't last forever. Of course, uh, the pendulum changes and how much pollution the public is willing to deal with uh, changes. Uh, whereas in the progressive era, we saw industrialization and manufacturing as a as a general good, and the environment was a secondary uh, thought. As we grew richer, wealthier, and uh, uh, more advanced, uh, the, our desire for environmental quality increased as well. And we see this the pattern of this historically is very clear, not just in the United States but elsewhere, uh, where you have a low per capita income, you have very low interest and concern and public uh, value on environmental quality. You concern yourself more with wealth creation. But as you grow wealthier, as per capita income increases, public interest in protecting the environment increases as well because environmental quality is in many extents, to some extent, a luxury good in some uh, dynamics. And in others, when it comes to human health, uh, you know, what good does uh, living th from the age of – instead of dying at 72, you die at 78 if you never got a job when you were in your 20s or 30s. So uh, with wealth creation and industrial advance, we saw more and more public interest in environmental protection. Now, we – this was primarily – the regulatory operations were primarily state and local up until around 1970. And we've published some books uh, and essays. Uh, in particular, uh, Indra Goglani wrote an excellent book for us on the history of the Clean Air Act and, and clean air in general, clean air regulation. And what he found is the greatest uh, re restrictions in pollution or the greatest reductions in pollution we saw were under this regime of state and local regulatory authority, not under the EPA. Now, you could argue there was a lot of low-hanging fruit uh, back in those days. But we moved to a federal response to pollution control and away from state and local, not because pollution levels were increasing, ambient concentrations going up, the regulations weren't, uh, weren't restrictive enough. They were quite restrictive, uh, at least for that time, and pollution was indeed going down. But there were some episodic events like the Cuyahoga River, which uh, on uh, catches fire, on yeah. fire. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of other political things that were coming, coming into play that we don't necessarily need to get into, uh, which encouraged federal action. One of the most important drivers for the Clean Air Act uh, was, again, this age-old story of, uh, of uh, bootleggers and Baptists making a coalition. Uh, the story that David Schoenbrod tells, who uh, at the time was uh, on the staff, I think, of Hubert Humphrey. He was on the Senate staff of Humphrey, and he ended up being an attorney at NRDC for a number of years is that uh, the Clean Air Act largely uh, was driven by the fact that U.S. auto manufacturers in, uh, who had operations in California found extremely restrictive uh, regulations coming down the pike in California. Uh, New York was threatening to uh, undertake the exact same restrictions. And so the uh, automakers thought, well, how the heck do we get out of this? How do we, how do we dodge these legislative bullets coming out of California and New York? And uh, uh, their, their answer – uh, was to take it to Washington and argue that uh, we needed one uniform national policy on pollution rather than 50 individual states dictating things, particularly when New York and California, through their, through their very uh, uh, centrality of the U.S. manufacturing system, could, in, it could in, uh, impose a de facto national standard without national input. And so the Clean Air Act was a coalition of environmentalists who 
were frustrated they weren't getting as much as they would like in many arenas. And a lot of industrial actors who were finding that state and local regulations were becoming too restrictive and this was a way to go around the corner. And so they joined forces and produced the Clean Air Act. And then, of course, the Clean Water Act and everything fell like dominoes. So now we have a federal uh, a federal regulatory regime. Well, it seems kind of interesting because you have <clears> – <throat> You have these two actors involved with sort of their own preferences for how much pollution uh, there should be, environmentalists with a, pre- a preference for less pollution and maybe auto manufacturers with some and more uniform standards they can deal with. But the, the interesting question that they're, that they're trying to ask and get answered on a federal level is how much pollution should there be? Right. And that's, the, that's a question I find fascinating because one of the things you learn in economics is the answer to that question is not zero, first of all, because for the reasons you said in the 30s, that pollution also came with manufactured goods. But I always say that there's an optimal amount of pollution in the environment just like there's an optimal amount of dirt in your house. At some point, you don't want to clean your house anymore and at some point, you don't want to clean the environment anymore. So how do we try and decide that question? I'm not sure I agree agree with the proposition that we can identify the optimal amount of pollution no matter how hard we might try or might want to. And the reason I say that is that your willingness to pay to reduce exposure to environmental contaminants is relatively is, is going to vary by individual. Uh, and there's no right answer. I might be willing to pay X and you might be willing to pay Y and our differences in willingness to pay have a lot to do with our own personal preferences and the opportunity costs we face on those uh, expenditures and how highly we value our health and that's going to change by person. Some people smoke because, well, they, they have a different cost-benefit calculation than somebody else. It's not that they don't know that smoking is bad for them. So since we all have different subjective preferences – with regards to environmental protection and our willingness to pay to be free of environmental contaminants, there is no way to find a socially optimal level save for the aggregation of subjective personal preference. How do we do that? Well, you know, there are lots of games that economists play when they try to figure out what your willingness to pay might be uh, based on your revealed preferences in the market. And there's some very interesting studies in that regard. But we don't make laws based on academic studies with regards to revealed preferences in other arenas. We make them through politics. And so I'm not sure, you know, I, I'm speaking necessarily for all libertarians or, or even all people at the Cato Institute, but I've written in the uh, Cato Policy Handbook for, for – or Cato Handbook for Policymakers and in other places as well. My colleague Peter Van Dorn has also made this argument in the pages of regulation uh, that uh, there is no right answer for how much uh, environmental protection we, the people, should be willing to buy. Uh, I'm rather agnostic on the question. I have my preferences. Uh, my friend John Pascatondo used to run Greenpeace USA has his preferences. The only way to, uh, uh, to uh, deal with our differences when we're all consuming the same, you know, the same air shed and the same watershed is to aggregate them at the, at, uh, at the ballot box somehow. And that means that you know, well, while libertarians find themselves often uh, opposed to environmentalists for uh, this, that, or the other regulatory initiative, in reality, we can add to the conversation by pointing out what the costs and benefits are as we see them, but we can't use these cost-benefit calculations to tell people what they should or should not want. I'm curious about the, the difference going back to the regulatory regime for dealing with pollution versus this tort and property rights regime. As you said, we can compare kind of the early regulatory regime when it was state and local based and how effective it was to the current one of a, a federal system and we find more reductions in the local – when we had the local regime, right? But is there – can we do the comparison between the tort and property setup and the regulatory? Does, does one of them – is there evidence that the tort and property worked I mean obviously it worked better in the sense of being more restrictive because the manufacturers didn't like it as much. But can we compare historically or are there countries today that maintain a tort and property-based system that we can look at and see how well it works? That's a very good question. Let's look at these two comparisons. Uh, the argument – first, federal versus state. 
uh, the argument against state and local regulation was uh, a story about how there would be a race to the bottom. If you allow each uh, uh, locality or each state to make its own rules, people, you know, you're, you're going to see a competition reduce regulation to attract business and create jobs. That may have been true. In fact, probably was true back when social preferences were for more industrial production and more economic wealth creation and in, uh, which were stronger than, say, environmental protection. But that's certainly no longer the case. And in fact, it probably was not the case uh, going into the 1960s. Uh, now, what are the main fights that we see in environmental, uh, environmental law? You see primarily state attorney generals and governors s- filing lawsuits against EPA for not filing strict enough regulation. Uh, so if anything, the tables have turned and state and local control would probably produce uh, in most important jurisdictions – tighter, not looser environmental regulation because there's no longer a race to the bottom to create wealth. There is now a race to the top to produce attractive living conditions and and, uh, politically preferable uh, uh, regimes with regards to pollution. Now, that's not always the case. In Mississippi, you might see different rules than you'd find in Massachusetts. But on balance, uh, the higher the income level of a state uh, and the wealthier that state is, the more restrictive the environmental laws are going to be. And as we grow wealthier, we're going to find more and more preferences for environmental protection and less and less for wealth creation as a trade-off for environmental protection. Now let's look at the uh, tort versus regulatory trade-off. Uh, likewise, I mean, I mean there's a long history of this. Historians tell the story about – to the extent to which historians have paid attention to it, not many legal historians have. Uh, but to the extent to which they do tell the story, they do tell uh, a fairly convincing story, as I mentioned earlier, of uh, restrictive property rights regimes which were overthrown by industrial actors. Today, would we see the same thing? Now, it's, it's always generally been a libertarian story that this is the way to go, that we don't want politics to protect property. We'd rather have individual property owners protect property. But the difficulty in going back to that regime today or weighing it is that, first of all, uh, when you've got a many polluter problem, and we've discovered that it's that these are far more common than necessarily were understood back during the you know prior to the Progressive Era, it's very hard uh, to uh, surmount the transaction costs associated with identifying the polluter and identifying the victim. Take a simple example: the Chesapeake Bay. There are tens of millions of people who uh, by fertilizing their lawns in the summer contribute to pollution in the Chesapeake Bay. Tens of millions of, of, uh, of polluters. And there are likewise millions of people affected by this pollution. How are we going to identify – if we had property rights for the Chesapeake Bay, how in the world would we identify all these malefactors and bring them into court? The transaction costs could be staggering. Now, Murray Rothbard, uh, a fellow who's long been associated with the libertarian movement, once wrote a very good essay called uh, – uh, well, I don't remember the exact title, but we published it in Cato Journal uh, some 30 years ago where he looked at ways we might get around these transaction cost problems. And he made various different arguments for how one could imagine them through class action suits and aggregation of, uh, of, of tort and, and various other steps uh, and, and an aggressive regime of, of, uh, of, of property rights for environmental protection for how we could surmount this problem of large air sheds and large watersheds. Uh, and he makes you know, a, a case that a lot of people uh, you know, uh, have, have, have found compelling. Others haven't necessarily found it very compelling. But uh, at least it's out there. Now, libertarians have been peddling this story as in an ideal world, environmental protection will look like X. We would privatize environmental commons to the greatest extent possible and turn it back to the courts. Well, that used to be kind of a pie-in-the-sky idea that libertarians would offer. Uh, In fact, I've offered it uh, in front of Congress. And I remember after the 1994 elections, the NRDC invited me and David Schoenbrock to speak to their board of trustees. And I told that story about where we'd like to see policy go, thinking that a group of environmental lawyers ought to kind of like this, right? I'm going to empower environmental lawyers to protect the environment based on a property rights regime. They ought to kind of like that idea. They didn't like it at the time. But today, what do we see? We see this argument having been resurrected. Uh, it has gone through an intellectual renaissance and what used to be thought of as kind of a fringy, kooky, uh, neo-anarchist or anarcho-capitalist argument has been embraced increasingly by environmentalists. And you're seeing more and more lawsuits from the environmental community against polluters not based on violating public regulation but based on trespass and nuisance. So what do we do when – 
say, uh, an industrial actor is hit with a trespass or nuisance suit, uh, when that suit is occurring under a rubric of the Clean Air Act and various other regulatory initiatives. What courts have done is argued, yeah, for the most part, you don't have standing. These environmental laws make public these environmental resources and they're no longer subject to private lawsuits for trespass or nuisance because that presupposes that these resources are actually privately held. Now, the interesting thing to me for libertarians is what do we make of that? Well, it turns out that for a lot of libertarians, the belief in a tort-based regime for protecting the environment seemed to be more a matter of at least theoretical convenience, not practical reality because once those suits got filed, where were libertarian actors uh, when it came to commentary or amicus briefs? Almost always on the side. And uh, the arguments were, well, this would be impractical, that you don't have standing, uh, you know, nuisance and trespass is, over, is superseded by uh, these laws, it's more appropriate this way. If we had a regime of trespass and nuisance, you would shut down the industry. Amazing, coming from, inv- from, coming from libertarians. So when you ask me well, how libertarians you know, would compare this world to that world or what we might think of it, I guess it depends on which libertarian you talk to. Some libertarians would argue that that regime really would deindustrialize the country, would empower a handful of Sierra Club members to shut down the auto industry if they happen to live uh, near automakers or uh, would shut down the L.A. basin because, well, you know, it only takes only a couple of lawsuits to do that. Uh, and others would argue, no, there would be cozy and bargaining and things like that, which would uh, even out. But it turns out that when push came to shove, when environmentalists started picking up these tort-based arguments – to pursue their claims rather than argue that, well, let's, let's look at them on their merits. Uh, most libertarians, to the contrary, repair to the regulatory state. And that probably gets into something about environmentalism, uh, maybe the feelings that the idea brings forth in a lot of libertarians uh, who might have more allegiances with conservatives and republicans in general because envir- that there's a big dividing line there. There has been a change. Now, I, now just, just for the, the sake of uh, disclosure, I'm not entirely convinced that a tort-based regime in the Rothbardian sense as he's offered it or in the historical pre-progressive uh, era sense is necessarily the right approach to environmental protection in many circumstances. In, in cases where the transaction costs involved in uh, privatizing environmental resources uh, are low, that, that I have no problems with it. I would definitely go in that direction. So, for instance, we're dealing with groundwater aquifers, which are uh, uh, which don't have a lot of these uh, many actor problems. It seems reasonable to me. This would be a, a privatizing groundwater aquifers and allowing owners to then protect their uh, property against pollution uh, in tort makes sense to me. But dealing with you know auto exhaust emission or the Chesapeake Bay or climate change or acid rain through tort. That's very problematic. So I don't want to be tagged as a guy who's bemoaning the loss of anarcho-capitalism and tort-based uh, environmental law. Uh, that having been said, there has, I think, been – it's fair to say there's been a shift in the, in the libertarian in community over the years since I've been at the Cato Institute. Anyway, I've been here for 23 years and today, rather than hearing a lot of conversation about how property rights uh, can better protect the environment than can regulators – we're hearing more and more stories from the libertarian and, quote, free market, unquote, community about how my right to make a widget trumps your right not to have pollution from said widget in your lungs. That industrialization is a good in and of itself, that the benefits of wealth creation swamp the costs of environmental exposures and, well, uh, to put it in vernacular, buddy ought to suck it up. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is a change. I mean, it, it wasn't always the case that libertarians were uh, happy to embrace wealth creation, industrial growth, uber alles. Uh, historically, libertarians were born uh, out of a set of ideas which argued that property rights were nearly inviolate. And the state's job is simply to protect your rights to life, liberty, and property. Uh, whether that maximized wealth creation or not is kind of secondary. There's no you know, asterisk in uh, – the Declaration of Independence or in the uh, U.S. Constitution that says, oh, these things are all well and good as long as it maximizes wealth creation. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure I like this development in the libertarian community, but it's one that I think is, is quite obvious. Um, I wanted to turn to some specific issues within – some specific environmental issues because we've just talked about kind of in general how to think about these things and one of them that gets – talked about a lot and so I thought maybe you could 
explain to us what this means and how we should think about this issue is is cap and trade as a way of dealing with pollution of various kinds. So because typically we have a – you know, the way we typically think of the government addressing pollution is just say, well, you can't – you can only pollute so much or you can't put any of those sorts of emissions into the air. But cap and trade introduces presumably some kind of market um, Mechanism, mechanisms yeah. into the into the regulations. So what is what is cap and trade and how does it work and is it is it effective? Is it a good way to address some of these problems? It might very well be the best way to address some of these problems. It really depends on what problems we're talking about. Now, uh, if we want market approaches to environmental protection, and virtually all economists would argue that it's far better to allow market actors to uh, uh, control pollution than have regulators simply because efficiency is more likely to be found when uh, private actors are undertaking this job simply for all the reasons that uh, Hayek might identify in the fatal conceit. There's no way that any central plant or central regulator can have all the information necessary to know exactly how to most efficiently reduce pollution at every single facility uh, in, every, in every sector of the economy, in every locality in the United States. It, it, it defies ability to believe. Simply because what costs X in Michigan might not cost the same in California or for this plant or that plant and the technology may be different. And even the cost of environmental damages can be very different. A unit of uh, of auto exhaust emissions in Sioux City, Iowa causes far less harm at the margin than that same unit of auto exhaust in uh, in, in New York City. So we would have far different pollution regimes if you were to try to maximize efficiency. So the idea is to let market actors undertake this job rather than regulators. Well, there's really two ways you can do that. The two main ways you can do that is you can just tax people for their pollution and then they act accordingly. It essentially allows – the variable is, uh, is the amount of pollution. The fixed determinant is the price of pollution. A cap and trade regime flips it and says the fixed determinant is the amount of pollution. The variable is how much it's going to cost to reduce that pollution. Now, which is preferable, you know, uh, that sort of cap and trade regime where you cap the pollution and then let market actors trade for permits to pollute under in, in that regime or to tax them for pollution and then just see what happens. It really depends on the circumstances. If there is a big threshold, let's assume that pollution up to point X uh, is only a modest uh, concern, but pollution over point X has much more greater damages at the margin than a cap and trade regime where you establish the, the – where you fix the amount of pollution that's, uh, all, that is uh, tolerable, it would make more sense. If you weren't in a regime like that and it was more linear and you know, just each unit had the same marginal uh, costs, then you know, a tax might be preferable there. Uh, so it really depends on what world we're looking at and uh, how you understand the stylized scientific facts regarding this, that or the other environmental problem. So should we be afraid though of putting that into a politicized – a politicized mechanism, the cap and trade at the at the federal level, and what sort of things are going to come out in terms of more opportunities for crony capitalism, well, more opportunities yeah. for weird pricing and all, all different types of. I guarantee exemptions. you that any government intervention or any government act is going to introduce all of those phenomena. And the conceit that a cap and trade program introduces the opportunity for political rent seeking and cronyism and inefficiencies through mucking around with who gets the permit under what terms and conditions how long the permits are allowed to uh, go before lapsing and what the trade rules are with the permits and this is an infinite playground for special interests and uh, that sort of thing all true but i haven't noticed the tax code being all that simple either so the alternative of well a pollution tax would be far more efficient straightforward and hard much much harder to mess with well the, the, the tax code tells us that's just a pipe dream as well. There's infinite ways you can mess with the tax code and we do it all the time. So the complaint against going forward with either a, with, with a cap and trade because of these charges is a, is, is a complaint that is universalizable. Uh, you can make that complaint of virtually involved to engage and, and take issue with every single government act in the economy. Now, since we're libertarians and not anarchists, we're generally unpersuaded by these arguments. So, for instance, when it comes to protect, producing public goods, we don't say better to have no military at all than a military because if we have a military, before you know it, we're going to be throwing the military around and engagements have nothing to do with the protection of the United States, the people, the liberties of the of people of the United States, and we're going to be captured by special interests and different lobbying groups for different ethnicities or national uh, uh, subgroups and no, we don't make that. We know that's going to happen, 
but far worse to be in a regime in which the United States had no military protection at all, which is why we're not anarchists. Uh, now, you can make a credible argument for the anarchist position. Don't get me wrong. I don't mean to denigrate it. It's simply not a libertarian argument. Similarly, when it comes to protect, prov- providing public goods in the domestic economy, you make the same argument against the judicial system. You can make the same argument against public law. You can make the same argument against a whole host of things, including environmental protection, all of which are true. But – if that were a good argument for rejecting cap and trade on space, it's a good argument for rejecting the United States Navy. It's a good argument for rejecting the court system. It's a good argument for not having police. So um, <clears throat> since we created this uh, federal system mostly as we were talking about uh, in the 60s and 70s, I think Clean, Clean Air Act was 71 uh, possibly, all around that time. Um, have we seen pollution go down and and the environment get cleaner in general and do you think we can – assign that cause to those laws? Well, we have seen environmental uh, quality improve in most though not in all arenas where we have measurable data. Uh, The uh, uh, ambient concentrations of virtually every pollutant we can track have declined uh, save for one pollutant, that's CO2. Now, it is going under decline these days because uh, you've seen an uh, uh, industrial retreat after the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, but uh, for every other constituency declines. Now, there are a lot of complicating factors for why. Wealth creation uh, is one reason. Uh, I mean, after all, uh, we do see a, a strong correlation between per capita income and ambient concentrations of pollutants. And that, has to, and that drives a lot of different things. It drives environmental preferences for environmental quality. The more the public wants to – the more willing the public is to pay for environmental quality is associated with how many resources the, – well, what the degree of resources the public has. Uh, and of course, uh, preferences for environmental quality just seem to go up amongst wealthier people and they tend to be lower amongst poorer people. So that's one reason that wealth creation and drives environmental improvements. Uh, another is just efficiency. After all, pollution is a waste product uh, and industry would rather not waste resources. They'd rather capture them for profits. So in the 1950s, for instance, if you're going to make a beer can, it would take a tremendous amount of material inputs and they were very – uh, very sturdy and you know, in, in old movies, uh, motorcycle gang members would crush a beer can to show how tough they were to scare the townsfolks and intimidate them into getting their free booze and pool games. Of course, today, uh, my grandmother can crush a beer mm-hmm. can and commonly does. They're made – they're just extremely light and flexible. Well, how is that? Uh, well, the thing – the reason they're so much lighter and flexible and they're so easily to crush is it takes far, far, far fewer material inputs to make that Coke can. And far less aluminum and far less material inputs to make the cool, uh, beer can re- also follows for less pollution. There's less material needs, therefore less pollution associated with it. Beer can manufacturers didn't do that out of the goodness of their hearts. They didn't do it because uh, Greenpeace or EDF or NRDC or anybody else sued them into doing it. They didn't do it for PR purpose. They did it to reduce overhead costs. And it just so happens that to reduce overhead costs, you reduce material inputs. So all these things drive. But, you know, environmental regulations probably have a role to play in this as well. It used to be that uh, polluters never had to account for the external damages caused by their pollution. And everything we see in the environmental code today is largely – at least advertised as trying to remedy that problem. Command and control regulatory regimes implicitly make them pay, uh, as do the various uh, trading regimes that become more popular, cap and trade programs, which we see with uh, constituents that contribute to acid rain and various other things. So it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. It's not, it's not such an easy story to say it's this, that, or the other. It's a lot of different things working together. A lot of what you just said runs counter to a narrative that – is pretty popular, particularly on the environmentalist left, that you, you said that wealth creation, economic growth leads to or causes us to tend to pollute less or pay more attention to the environment or willing to trade in favor of the environment. Um, and that also the advances in technology will lead us to use fewer resources to get the same number of outputs, the, the declining amount of metal in a beer can. Um, but we often hear from people – like an opposite argument that economic growth causes us you know the wealthier we get the more we consume so therefore the more environmental damage we do you know we everyone has a car now and so everyone's out polluting even more than when most people couldn't afford a car and so to some degree a clean planet is incompatible with industrialized planet right with just a, a planet where people are getting wealthier that at some point we're just going to we're going to overrun the environment. Suck it dry, yeah. Suck yeah. the earth dry. 
So you're saying that that narrative just doesn't – No, it's just simply not true. I mean it's, it's intuitively attractive narrative. I mean it seems plausible on its face and why would you argue with it? But then how do you, how do you square that narrative with the fact that air quality in China is improving and not declining? Mm-hmm. I mean, Chi- uh, Chinese uh, – the, the, the rate of automobile ownership used to be very, very tri- small in China. Now it's, gr- it's obviously growing in leaps and bounds. Wouldn't that lead to greater concentrations of uh, air pollutants in uh, Chinese cities? Well, it's not. Air pollution is declining and not increasing. There are a lot of different reasons for that. But you can, you can ch- test these narratives against uh, uh, publicly available data with regard to ambient pollution concentrations and find that, no, they decline. They decline with wealth creation. Uh, now, of course, it's not a perfect relationship. What usually happens is uh, these are the environmental Kuznets curves are, are what the statisticians talk about. When per capita income is very low, as you industrialize, pollution does increase. Ambient concentrations do increase up to a certain level and each, and each different constituent uh, is going to have a slightly different uh, uh, looking bell curve. But once per capita income tops at a certain level, sometimes it's 6,000 per capita, G, uh, uh, sometimes it's 7, sometimes it's 4, sometimes it's 9, then it begins to decline again. And it declines right down that curve just as quickly as it ran up. So it really depends whether industrialization is increasing pollution based on where you are on that uh, Kuznets curve. But we do see that in the most advanced civilization, advanced societies, Western Europe, the United States, uh, places like that, pollution levels are a, are a tiny fraction of what they are in the industri- or, or the deindustrialized world. I shouldn't say de. That kind of implies they were industrialized at one point. Uh, the unindustrialized or, low, or lesser developed countries, you see much higher levels of pollution. And one of the reasons for that is it takes a lot of it takes a lot of wealth to protect environmental resources just from day to day living. Uh, one of the biggest advances in uh, environmental quality in the United States is something you never think of, and that's uh, sanita- sanitation. And uh, and wastewater treatment. Uh, if you if you are a poor society, there is no wastewater treatment. Wherever you uh, defecate, it's it's probably going to end up in a stream somewhere. And if you don't have the money to uh, clean streams, well, you're going to have dirty water. Turns out that kills millions and millions of people uh, every year around the world, and it costs tens of millions of dollars to build these facilities. Even just uh, 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 primary treatment. The United States is engaged in tertiary treatment of water quality, and these facilities are extremely expensive, like power plants. Poor societies can't afford them. Poor societies suck it up and deal with poor water quality. Poor societies don't have an electrical grid, so how do they get their heating and cooking needs met? Well, they they heat and cook on site. Which Uh, which which is more pollution. Which is far more pollution. There's far more uh, uh, cases of uh, of deaths associated with air pollution simply from people cooking in their their small hut or in their small house than there is from uh, electrifying a country because it's far more efficient and far easier to control pollution from central station power plants than from dispersed uh, 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 energy creation on a household basis. That may not always be the case, but that's certainly been the case over the last uh, several centuries. And so – you know these things don't ever, don't don't ever look sexy to environmentalists. Uh, these sorts of very mundane uh, environmental protections. But even Larry Summers uh, has argued, as has virtually everybody who's paid any attention to this, the poverty is the number one environmental killer. If you want to save people, what you want to do is get them out of poverty because there's far more pollution associated with poverty than there is uh, in the industrialized world. Well, it's interesting too because there's other counterintuitive things that I know I grew up with. Uh, <clears throat> whole discussions of how it was important it was to recycle and all these things. Uh, but there are probably more trees now, I think, than there used to be because we're ordering more trees when we buy paper. Oh, exactly. I mean, what what the, the, what people forget is that we create resources. We don't just consume them. If we did, we'd run out of chickens every couple of years. Yeah. That would be the end of that. Uh, we grow trees for paper production. We have tree plantations. Not all. You know, sometimes we don't. But for the most part, uh, we produce our resources as we need them. We don't run out of corn. That we make a whole lot of uh, tortillas, uh, and we eat corn chips, and we have corn flakes, and corn additives for a whole lot of things. But we grow more of it, and the same thing applies to paper. Uh, when it comes to resources, well, you know, we can't grow our own grow our own aluminum, but it turns out we got plenty of aluminum in this world. Uh, as far as glass, we're not running out of sand. Energy inputs are the main determinant for whether you know we use a glass container or a plastic container or something else. And when energy is cheap, we make certain kinds of containers, and there's certain prices associated. With it, when energy is more expensive, the prices go up, and certain other containers become more popular. Uh, so, so in general, would you say recycling is not 
really worth it? Well, it depends on what we're talking about. It's worth it if the if the market tells us it's yes. worth it, right? If if I can get a price for something I'm throwing away in the private market, then it tells me somebody values it. But if it costs, but if I can't get a price for it, if nobody's willing to pay me for it, it tells me it doesn't have a great deal of value. And you know, there's no market failure involved in post consumer material. It's just that the market generally doesn't really need this stuff. If it had to pay me for it. You know, it's not worth my time. It'd be a fraction of a penny for each can I save. So why would I bother? You know, but we recycle for you know uh, almost social, civic, uh, symbolic reasons. They happen to be popular. If you poll people, recycling is an awful popular activity. Uh, if you left it at the market, I don't think it'd be quite so popular. One of the resources that we always hear about using up that we can't we can't grow more of the way we can corn and chicken is is oil. Um, and so there's been a big push for not only limiting use of oil because of the pollution that it creates but also because we're going to run out and so what we need are clean energy alternatives, um, including biofuels, which would be turning that corn that we can grow more of into gasoline for our cars. And we certainly it, shouldn't be doing anything like building the Keystone Pipeline or anything that encourages us to use oil and not get away from it. Yeah. So is there – is that a legitimate concern both about – um, about oil running out or needing to switch off of for other reasons and are these these clean energy proposals that we hear so much about from politicians and from companies that want politicians to create green energy proposals, are they valuable at all? A couple of observations about that. First of all, it's a, if it is indeed true that we're about to run out of crude oil, that we're rapidly depleting crude oil, crude oil resources, we, need, we don't need any government plan to move to green energy or non-fossil fuels. That will happen endogenously in the market. The scarcer crude oil becomes, the more expensive it is, the more competitive green energy will become. Uh, and at some point when uh, oil becomes scarce enough, green energy will become cheaper and people will endogenously move away from crude oil. Uh, the old saw that I hear at countless policy conferences like this is that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. We found better ways uh, than stones to accomplish our ends. Uh, so if you believe this story that we're running out of crude oil, it does not necessarily follow the government need lift even a single finger. This will occur endogenously in the market, not out of anybody's – the goodness of anybody's heart, but out of the rapacious desire to make profit and to save resources, which environmentalists are always shaking their fists at. So uh, it's, a, it's a problem that is self-correcting. Now, if you ask the question, are we really running out of this stuff? Well, you know, if you look at the price data, uh, when it comes to crude oil, it's more expensive than it's ever been. I mean the, the interesting thing for me in this area, which I used to spend a great deal of time in at Cato, is that uh, over history uh, since uh, world, you know, even before World War II, oil prices after adjusting for inflation would generally float around at around $22, $24 a barrel uh, with, with big peaks and valleys. I mean it's, it's, it is a volatile market but the, but, vol but the volatility was episodic. And the equilibrium price tended to be around twenty two, twenty four. So you'd have these giant uh, peaks in price, and you see a collapse in oil uh, in, in the oil market. And and this is what we saw with lot, lots of movement in the data, but you know equilibrium numbers around twenty two, twenty four dollars a barrel. Uh, in two thousand and four, things began to change dramatically, and we're now seem to be in a world where the new equilibrium isn't that; it's double that, you know, triple that, quadruple that, uh, depending upon you know. What bait, what year we're comparing it with, and how, and, and so how we're you know normalizing or making real the price. Does this mean it's permanently more scarce? Some people think so. Some people would argue that our our present high price for crude or our present scarcity is driven by the fact that uh, OPEC nations have not reinvested in upstream production capacity since they uh, seized control of these oil fields in the early 1970s. The production capacity hasn't changed hardly at all. Uh, it turns out, however, there's a heck of a lot of excess production capacity in the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s, and there isn't now. We've slowly eaten it all away. And so now we're seeing nor higher prices. Will OPEC reinvest in upstream production capacity? Because they certainly could do it and expand it. We don't see any real signs they're doing much of that. So it might be that, well, we are running out if the metric for this is, you know, the supply of crude relative to demand of crude. But usually when we hear this, we're not really hearing that. What we're hearing are stories about, you know, peak oil and the ultimate extent of these reserves, regardless of how interested we are in investing upstream. 
And to this, you know, my own opinion is I see no particular reason to think we're close to peak oil. Uh, and that story comes from the observation that there's conventional crude oil, which is usually what the peak oil is looking at. But there's unconventional crude oils as well. And, you know, fracked crude is an example of unconventional crude oil. The, cra- the shale coming – or the, the oil coming out of uh, Canada and Al- the Alberta fields, uh, this is an example of unconventional crude. And as oil prices go up, these unconventional crudes, which are more expensive to produce, uh, become economic and they come to the market and trillions of barrels come with them. Uh, and that story can play out even several iterations beyond the unconventional crudes we're looking at. So I don't see any particular reason to think we're on the uh, we're on the cusp of, of peak oil. On the other hand, the future is unknowable, uh, and there's all and, and the, there's a lot of disagreement about what the ulti- ultimately recoverable reserve levels are for crudes, whether conventional or unconventional. So all I can tell you is someday there will be a peak in crude oil production. When will that day come? I do not know. And if people had very firm ideas about when that day would come, they can make a heck of a lot of money in the futures market. And there are some people uh, who do bet on a near peak in crude oil production or at least – at the very least, they're betting on increased scarcity for crude not going away anytime soon and in fact becoming uh, more and more pronounced over time. And they are investing in futures markets and for quite a long time, they're making some pretty good money and depending upon how they've uh, dealt with their portfolio, they're still doing OK with that strategy. So I don't think that it's useful for libertarians to make – uh, uh, dogmatic statements with regards to the level of ultimately recoverable stock or peak crude or anything like that. All we need to say and all we can really fairly say is that the ultimate scarcity of something is best measured by its market price because it's scarce compared to what? Compared to demand. Uh, if something's becoming more scarce, it's going to become more expensive. We're going to see that assuming that we strip out all the uh, things which might otherwise distort the price, whether we're talking subsidies or uninternalized externalities or something like that. And then we'll see. If it's becoming more scarce, it's going to become more expensive. It's a problem of self-correcting. Qu- quite honestly, green energy will come without the need of Al Gore becoming president or John Kerry getting the job or – Hillary Clinton or uh, NRDC taking over the Department of Energy or anything of the kind. It's naturally going to occur because market forces will bring it. The real debate we have today is whether the government ought to goose the market and say, well, we know it's coming and it's not here quite yet where green energy is more competitive, but it's soon going to be there and we want a head start in solving this problem so the government's going to jump in. And that's really what this debate is about. So what what do we say to that? Uh, we had uh, Solyndra was a scandal a couple of years ago for one of those sort of pet green energy products. But what what do you see tends to happen if the uh, if the government steps in and says we need to get ahead of the market and be better at doing this and start making some green energy initiatives? Well, if I put on my red meat hat, I would say the government is very poor at picking winners in uh, technology markets, whether we're talking about energy markets or any other markets. Uh, if I'm being less churlish, I would say nobody's very good at picking winners in energy markets. Uh, and in fact, uh, one, of, one of my favorite uh, essays on this topic uh, is a chapter in a book written by Vaslav Smil. Uh, the book is called Energy at the Crossroads. He's got a chapter in that book called uh, uh, Against Energy Forecast or Against Forecasting in which he documents all of the forecasts made with regards to market share and price for various uh, 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 elements of the energy market, natural gas, crude oils, various you know, renewable energies, uh, things like that, uh, from government, from banks, from trade associations, from academics, uh, from the uh, industry themselves, from uh, various consultants, from futurists, from uh, Nostradamus, from uh, from Newt Gingrich, if you even want to go that far. And he finds that nobody has a very good track record here, not just government, but industry doesn't either, and neither does academia, and neither do think tanks. And in fact, drunk monkeys could outperform virtually any of them when it comes to retrospectively looking at these forecasts that have been made. And this is, again, not just with price, but with technology and market share and technological breakthroughs and the evolution. It's, it's, it's all very uncertain. All we can know – so we can't know with any degree of, uh, of accuracy what the competitive technologies of tomorrow might look like. Uh, to give you a good example of that, uh, on the very eve of the uh, revolution of the fracking industry brought on by George Mitchell uh, in Texas, uh, we found that people – who were relying on natural gas were shipping their facilities out of the United States and their investments out of the United States because they saw an eternal 
future of high U.S. gas prices relative to Europe and the Middle East and elsewhere. And so they were fleeing, largely the petrochemical industry, well, not the petrochemical industry was fleeing, but this the chemistry, chemical industry, DuPont and Dow were just shipping plants out of here and investments out of here as fast as they possibly could. This is on the very eve of the fracking revolution. Nobody saw this coming. Which is, which is to clarify, well, what was that revolution? Well, fracking's been around for about you know for about a hundred years. There's nothing new about fracking. Uh, but what George Mitchell did uh, was that he improved the process and used pressurization and different chemical solutions, and various and he, and he used various new technologies associated with horizontal drilling and and all sorts of things to make far more efficient and far more productive fracking than it ever had been before. This is something he had been working on for a long time, but most investors didn't think it was going to really pan out, and it did. The point is nobody saw that coming. The biggest revolution in energy markets since World War II, I believe, will end up being this fracking revolution. Nobody saw it coming enough. Nobody saw this coming. No one's going to see when the breakthrough occurs that makes solar power uh, economic, which is conceivable. There are all kinds of ways scientists can tell you with just this little improvement or that little improvement, this innovation or solving this little problem, boom, everything changes. I've heard those stories for a long time, but it is yet to happen. doesn't mean it never will happen, but it means I take with a giant grain of salt predictions that tomorrow's solar power is going to displace coal. But it could happen. Well, but if it does happen, markets will deliver it and uh, our, the ability of government to deliver it with R&D and, and basic science and all that is very attenuated simply because, one, they have no better idea than I do what to invest in. And secondly and more importantly, their decisions are primarily driven by political metrics, not economic or scientific metrics because they're politicians or they're regulators or bureaucrats that answer to politicians. And so the politically popular stuff is going to get attention. The less politically popular stuff isn't. I had read a story uh, a few years ago about a guy who invented an amazingly efficient gas engine, uh, that proof of concept. I don't know how efficient. It cost him millions of dollars to make, but it worked. Uh, and he went to an energy trade show where trying to get governments to invest in it, especially Germany and France and like that. But but it was politically impossible for them to do that because they would say, you invested in, in gas. You, and so they would get political f- feedback from that. But it may be the case that highly efficient gas engines are – a good way for the well, future. You know, we, I, we don't even know. I don't know about your narr- I don't know about this particular story, but you know, the, something smells fishy right away. Uh, why does he need to go to government for money? I mean, if he's got an efficient internal combustion engine that's you know so incredibly attractive, then why isn't Ford or somebody else investing in it? This this is their job. Probably because th- the, mon- th- the governments are giving it away, giving money to away for those things. Yes, but. Uh, is, is, General Motors and Ford and various other automakers would love to have this technology because it would make them great profit. If they could sell you a car, they got double or triple the gas mileage of your current car at very low cost. Of course, they'd try to sell it. And if somebody walked into their into their showroom or into their trade show or into their boardroom saying, look at this wonderful device and I will give it to you for the low, low price of X as long as they gain more than they lose in the transaction, of course, they're going to make that deal. You hear stories like this all the time of some whiz-bang wonderful energy technology that for some reason everybody's trying to stop or nobody's impressed with. It tells a, deg- it tells a story of market failure that, it, that would be so epic that if these stories were commonplace or even true in a few circumstances, that it's a miracle that uh, we've created any wealth at all through capitalism because we know as a general matter these market failure stories don't hold up, at least that, that version of it. For a final question, I wanted to ask, talking to our audience of – libertarian listeners, where do libertarians go wrong in the way that we talk about environmentalism? And libertarians too often talk as if either they don't care about the environment or that caring about the environment is the antithesis of caring about uh, uh, the well-being of mankind or that caring about the environment is some sort of signal, uh, Pace say in Ayn Rand novel, uh, that you hate mankind or that you have an epistemological flaw somewhere or that you know you have these weird sense of priorities that you know are somehow signaling some other you know character flaw or, or intellectual flaw or something of that nature i think that's just that that's that's counterproductive and it's analytically suspect if Environmental preferences are subjective. A libertarian should not be in the business of telling people they should not have environmental preferences. That's, that's sort of like saying, well, if, if, ice, if taste and ice cream are subjective, libertarians should be in the business of telling people they shouldn't like strawberry. Why? Some people, including a lot of libertarians, by the way, do care about wild places. They do enjoy backpacking. They don't 
they are willing to pay to reduce the level of contaminants in the environment, even if the risks are very small, even if the costs of doing so are higher than uh, are comfortable for some people to pay. They care. Uh, and there's no reason necessarily they shouldn't care. It's a subjective preference. Libertarians should be in the business of allowing subjective preferences to reign whenever possible. And sometimes our personal subjective preferences aren't matched by majority preferences. But in those regimes where we can't provide for private provision of environmental goods, and in some places we can, but a lot of places we can't, then respect for the preferences of others means respect for – for social preferences the guards to environmental protection. And this idea that, that environmental protection is inimical to a modern society is just silly. I mean, it's, it's silly on its face. We have had tremendous investments in environmental protection over the last century. Lots of money spent on taking contaminants out of smokestacks. Tax. Lots of environmental cleanups have been going on. The regular costs of environmental protection are not trivial. And yet we've continued to see industrial growth and activity and wealth creation. Maybe not as much as we would have seen otherwise. But on the other hand, there are indeed uh, uh, third-party costs associated with the environment. They would be paid by somebody. So I think that environmental quality is one of those areas that libertarians, I think, make a big mistake by declaring friend and foe. Uh, I think the best that we can do to contribute to this discussion is to talk about how to most efficiently provide the goods, environmental goods and services that people want, whether it's through private provision of goods or if it's going to be through public provision of goods, then how to most efficiently do that. Uh, and, and that's where we can, we can help. And I think that's the most consistent libertarian position, not one which tells people they're not allowed to have what they manifestly do want and are willing to pay for Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.